Hi everyone, this is Jill Rourke. I'm the lead for the Adolescent Immunization Communications Team here at CDC, and we are so happy that you could join us today for webinar number three of the preteen vaccine um, adolescent immunization webinar series. So today we're going to be talking about uh, a review of the ACIP meeting that just occurred on Wednesday and Thursday of this week, and then some opportunities for improving um, rates of HPV and other adolescent vaccination over the summer before the big back to school rush. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So just want to remind everybody that your lines have been muted automatically. Uh, we will be recording this webinar, so um, I think you heard as if you were on at the beginning, um, the session is being recorded. The presentation um, and the recording will be placed online. We will send out a notice um, to the same email address that you registered with to let you know when those are available. As you have questions, go ahead and type your question into the questions panel and uh, we will be reading selected questions out loud for the presenters to answer. One other thing, if um, you need to walk away from your phone for some reason, please don't put your phone on hold. Thanks. All right, so I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Cindy Weinbaum, who is um, currently acting as the secretary for the ACIP. Thanks, Jill. Um, great, so I'm just going to cover a few of the topics that were discussed at the ACIP meeting over the last couple of days for folks who didn't catch the ACIP meeting either in person or on the webcast. Um, the topics that I'm going to cover um, have much broader applications than adolescents, but in fact, it seems like more and more of the vaccines that we discuss at ACIP do uh, apply to adolescents as well. Um, first, I'm going to tell you about the general recommendations. The general recommendations on vaccination is a broad-ranging, far-ranging document that covers a range of topics from the timing and spacing of vaccines to vaccine administration, storage and handling, to reporting adverse events um, after vaccination. It was last published in January 2011. The general recommendations is generally updated every three to five years. Um, there were six topics of the general recommendations that were presented to the October 2014 meeting. Um, as you might be aware, in February, the ACIP meeting was greatly truncated because of a threatened snowstorm. So um, the general recommendations were not discussed in February. And the second half of the general recommendations were discussed on Wednesday. Um, the topics that were discussed on Wednesday included um, altered immune competence, um, where updates were made that included such things as new specific conditions or medications that, class that were classified as altered immune competence, um, new recommendations for vaccination in the context of those conditions and medications including um, the specific um, contraindications for live vaccines, um, as well as intervals among the various vaccines, and um, hematopoietic cell transplants. So CDC and IDSA um, were somewhat out of sync with each other. And these updates to the altered immune competence recommendations bring the CDC and IDSA recommendations into sync. Other things that were discussed were special situations, such as the use of uh, yellow fever vaccine in breastfeeding women, Tdap in pregnancy, and vaccination for bleeding disorders. Um, vaccination records, which uh, covers immunization information systems and encourages um, interoperability of electronic health records and immunization information systems. Also defined the components of a functional immunization information system. Um, 
and uh, vaccination programs, the recommendations are just proposed to be updated with new national vaccine adult standards. So if the CDC uh, director approves the vote to uh, update these general recommendations, the general recommendations will then be sent forward for publication in the MMWR. Um, there was uh, an exciting session on meningococcal vaccines at ACIP. Um, as you might know two vaccines for serogroup B meningococcal disease have been licensed for use in the U.S. Uh, the MenB FHBP, which is called Trumemba, was licensed in October in a three-dose series. And the MenB4C was licensed in January in a two-dose series. Both of these vaccines are licensed in the U.S. for persons 10 through 25 years of age. Some interesting epidemiology was presented where um, it was shown that the incidence of disease for meningococcal disease has declined for all meningococcal serogroups, not only the meningococcal serogroups that are in the ACWY vaccine, but also serogroup B, and that in the United States we're currently at a stable low in disease incidence although you might be aware of recent outbreaks of meningococcal B on college campuses. There were approximately 55 to 65 cases of serogroup B meningococcal disease in adolescents and young adults each year for the last few years. The majority of these cases occur in older adolescents and young adults aged 16 to 24 years. About half of serogroup B occur in college students. And the incidence of serogroup B meningitis in college students and non-college students has been similar. Regarding the meningococcal B vaccines, the um, initial immunogenicity of both vaccines is good, but the data suggests that there's waning antibody levels within six months after the third dose. Um, that waning seems to stabilize uh, about uh, 6 to 48 months after the final dose. Um, also, the proportion of vaccinated uh, individuals who actually develop bactericidal antibodies may vary with each outbreak or circulating strain. This was seen in um, the Princeton outbreak with the vaccination program there. So it was proposed to ACIP that a serogroup B meningococcal vaccine series may be administered to adolescents and young adults aged 16 through 23 years of age to provide short-term protection against most strains of serogroup B meningococcal disease. Um, so moving on to HPV vaccines, um, as you may know, the updated HPV vaccine policy note for the nine-valent HPV vaccine was published in the MMWR in March. We expect that a nine-valent HPV vaccine will eventually replace the quadrivalent HPV vaccine in the U.S. market. Um, the um, discussion at ACIP focused on one element of the recommendation that we didn't have a chance to discuss in the February meeting, which was the, the topic of additional routine nine-valent HPV doses for persons who had already completed a three-dose HPV vaccination series. So, the, the conclusion of that discussion was that CDC will be developing guidance and information regarding people who started the HPV series with one vaccine product, whether they should um, consider different vaccine products for their additional two doses, 
current recommendations are that the three vaccines can be used interchangeably if needed. Um, and um, to clarify what data are and are not available. So we are hoping to get these guidances up soon on CDC's website. Uh, we also learned that an immunogenicity trial of a two-dose series of the nine-valent AHP vaccine is currently ongoing. We don't have results for that two-dose trial yet, but the work group was hoping that they would be able to show that to the ACIP in uh, late 2015 or early 2016. So there is no recommendation for any routine additional vaccination with nine valent HPV vaccine for persons who have completed an HPV vaccination series. Um, for TVAC vaccine, as I think you know, only pregnant women are recommended to receive more than one dose of TDAP. Um, the uh, ACIP learned that GFK is conducting clinical studies in the U.S. for revaccination after prior vaccination. Um, with regards to TDAP vaccine effectiveness, uh, previous estimates ranged between 66% and 78%. Um, and new estimates were done with individuals who had received um, only acellular pertussis vaccines as part of their childhood series. The estimated Tdep vaccine effectiveness in this group was 65%, consistent with previous studies. And the studies also looked at the duration of protection. Um, two studies were done in Washington and Wisconsin, and both showed that Tdap was effective, but that effectiveness decreased with increasing time since the receipt of Tdap vaccine. This is um, also of interest because recent studies have identified that siblings are the major source of infant pertussis. So the importance of that infant having maternally transferred antibody from maternal vaccination is really important. Um, finally, I'm just going to re re review the uh, flu vaccine session. So we saw the end of season estimates from the U.S. Influenza Vaccine Effectiveness Network. Um, for the 2014-2015 influenza vaccines. Um, in this season, only H3N2 and B viruses were circulating, so the effectiveness of the H1N1 component couldn't be assessed. But the overall adjusted vaccine effectiveness against any influenza was 23%. It ranged from 10% among the 18 to 49-year-olds, um, which was actually not statistically significant, to 36% among patients 65 and older. Um, what we saw with the, the live attenuated vaccine um, in the last couple seasons seemed to hold out this season. The live attenuated vaccine effectiveness was 9% overall. Um, and inactivated vaccines was about 30% overall. Um, in addition, there were safety data presented, and there was uh, an end-of-season analysis of their data, as well as that's the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, um, as well as two, report, two um, studies that were done in the Vaccine Safety Data Link. Um, for the uh, adolescent population, there were no new safety concerns, although a finding of um, febrile seizures in babies that had been found before and evaluated by the ACIP was uh, seen again with no lasting adverse effects of those um, febrile seizures. So that's all that I wanted to share about the ACIP meeting in terms of um, the new um, findings and thoughts of the work group. I'm 
I'm turning it back over to the organizers. All right, thank you very much, Cindy, for giving us that recap, very helpful. Um, next, I'm gonna turn it over to Ian, who's gonna talk about National Immunization Awareness Month, or NIAM, and uh, what kind of plans you can be making for this year's observance. Thanks, Jill. Uh, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so first off, I'd like to recognize all the diff all the various people that have um, helped out on National Immunization Awareness Month, both from CDC and the National Public Health Information Coalition. Um, so not National Immunization, Immunization Awareness Month, or NIAM, is an annual observance um, sponsored by the National Public Health Information Coalition. Uh, so NIFIC, in collaboration with uh, us here in CDC, has developed a communication toolkit to assist you with uh, promoting vaccination for people of all ages throughout the month. Um, so you can mix and match the materials in the toolkit any way you'd like, depending on the resources and priorities of your organization. And I'm just going to include a quick disclaimer. We are still finalizing the, uh, the toolkit for this year, but we are expecting that to be up um, in early July. So we'll keep you, stay tuned for that. So some of the objectives of NIAM. Um, it's really about highlighting the value of immunization for people of all ages. So there are four weeks of NIAM, and so each week is devoted to a different stage of the lifespan. And I'll go through that in more detail in a, in a few slides. Um, also important is promoting vaccination through traditional media, social media, and partner outreach. Um, and use, utilizing social media networks to circulate information and resources to target audiences. And um, really using the campaign to highlight uh, really highlighting the campaign, encouraging dissemination of materials throughout the month. So as I mentioned earlier, there are four uh, weeks of NIAM. So the first week is going to focus on um, pre-teens and teens, so all about getting those back-to-school shots. Uh, so that will be August 2nd through August 8th. Um, then the second week is going to focus is going to be August 9th through 15th, and it's going to focus on immunizations for pregnant women. So um, it's going to focus on the importance of pregnant women getting the flu vaccine and also the uh, Tdap vaccine to protect their unborn babies from uh, whooping cough in those first six months of life. Um, also, August 16th to 22nd is going to be the adult week, so focusing on uh, the vaccines that adults need. Um, and then August 23rd through 29th is going to be the last week, and it's going to focus on those uh, immunizations for infants and children infants and young children. And there will be a toolkit corresponding to each week. As I mentioned earlier, we're still working, we're still in the process of finalizing that, but those will be available in early July. Oh, too far. Um, so what's included in the toolkit? So um, each toolkit has key messages for each week uh, that you can use to, in, to put into your materials, or if you're doing any kind of media interviews, you can use that for that. Um, specific vaccine information, which is awful, helpful for developing materials. Uh, frequently asked questions, uh, if, whether it's from just the general public or uh, questions that media commonly ask. Um, also, there's ready to publish articles and news releases, uh, social media messages, logos and banners you can use on your website and social media, and then also um, a pretty comprehensive list of web links and resources if you really want to take a deep dive into this. So as I mentioned earlier, um, each week, uh, the, tool, the toolkits for each week contain key messages, um, including key messages you can use in a number of ways. Uh, so you can create your own materials, you can add a fresh touch to some of your existing materials, or uh, you can use it for media interviews, really just um, whatever, however you see it being able to help your organization, you can use that. Um, also, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the ready to publish articles. So these are pre-crafted articles for each week. And um, you can use these articles in, to place in newsletters on your website or in local news outlets. Um, so we have some articles that are geared towards parents and consumers, which encourage and educate, which encourage and motivate consumers to talk to their healthcare professional about vaccines. And there's also uh, that article, there's also ready to publish articles um, for healthcare professionals to encourage them to give strong recommendations for the vaccines their patients need. Um, you can also tailor the, 
You can also tailor the articles to your audiences as you see fit. They're really, um, you can have it, you can put in whatever input you think you need for your audience. Uh, and then in addition to these toolkits, we have, in addition to the articles in this toolkit, we have uh, available resources available on the CDC website. So there's a number of uh, ready to publish articles available on the CDC website, whether it's for childhood immunization, adolescent immunization, adult immunization. Um, Um, okay, and then social media. So NIAM 15, uh, NIAM is a really um, good way to get active on social media. So the official hashtag for NIAM will be hashtag NIAM 15. So really, you can highlight your participation with that hashtag. But we're also going to be using uh, hashtag Team Back to just kind of promote the idea of uh, everybody being part of Team Vaccine, whether you're a doctor, a nurse, a medical assistant, a parent. So just uh, really just using that to promote our vac our messages for vaccination. Um, so we'll be active on CDC will be active on social media throughout the month, generating tweets and Facebook posts for each week of NIAM. So we really encourage you to be active as well and um, you know share our content. We'll and um, use the key messages, uh, use the social media messages in our uh, in the communication toolkits. Um, we'll also be running a number of CDC features to correspond to the to the week of NIAM. So um, those are also really good tools that you can use to uh, to share on social media. Um, and then the big thing we're planning for this year is a thunderclap. Uh, so what exactly is a thunderclap? A thunderclap is a crowd speaking platform that you can use to amplify social media messages. So essentially what happens is CDC would set up a page, a thunderclap page with one social media messages and with one social media message and set a goal for um, a certain number of people to support that page. So kind of similar to a Kickstarter. So say uh, we have our tweet picked out and we want to have 100 people, 100 of our followers support that page. Um, so the social media message on that page will be disseminated automatically at the same time for all the profiles that support that page. So we're, we would pick one day in August and everybody who supports that page, the, the tweet would go out on all those platforms at the same, on all those um, accounts at the same time. So it would really kind of, we're all working together to amplify our social media messages and kind of expand our reach. Um, so I'll include more details closer to, uh, NIAM, there's still a lot of planning to, to do uh, between now and then. But for more information on kind of just what a thunderclap is, you can visit www.thunderclap.it. Um, and I'll include my contact information at the end of this slide as well, at the end of this presentation as well, if you have any questions on that. Also, um, I mentioned earlier we have logos and banners, uh, which some of these you've seen on the present on the presentation. Um, so these are really you can use them to spruce up your social media content. You can use them as cover photos, as uh, timeline photos. You can also use them on your website. Um, so there's a variety of ways you can use these. Just kind of spruce up your content. Um, and then also we are going to. Last year we did this as well, but we're going to have an online submission form as a way to kind of document all the great work that you're doing for NIAM. And I, I know a lot of the time, last year, um, a, a lot of examples I use for things you can do are things that partners have included in the submission form last year. So it's a really great way to showcase the great work that your organization is doing and kind of give other organizations ideas for things to do. And that will also be posted on the NIAM website. Um, again, like the toolkit, we are in the process of updating that. So that will be available um, in July. Um, if you have any questions or ideas, uh, feel free to email me at ibrandom at cdc.gov or um, for more information, you can go to www.nipic.org slash NIAM. Great. And I'll Thanks. Turn it over to Jim. Thanks so much, Ian. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some activities as you're planning for um, national. Uh, Immunization Awareness Month in August. Um, August is also the time that the majority of adolescent vaccines are given out. And so 
let's also talk a little bit about back to school. So we kind of break it up here at CDC as pre-back to school occurring in May and June, um, a little bit into July, and then really a big back to school push end of July, August, and then into September. So um, we had a feature last year about cancer prevention being on your back to school to-do list. And so that's basically what we want parents to be thinking about as they're preparing, um, purchasing school supplies and new clothes. We also want them thinking it's time for vaccinations. However, it's really difficult sometimes to get in, um, especially in the week before school starts. It seems to be the, um, no matter where you live, the week before school um, it tends to be the week that the doctor's offices are most crowded because everybody's trying to get their kids in at the last minute. Um, and so some of the things that we are suggesting is to encourage July appointments or hold uh, vaccine clinics in late July to get people um, in the frame of mind um, to start vaccinating their kid, get their kids vaccinated before the beginning um, of school. You know, and this really occurs in so many states because of the school mandates for Tdap and meningococcal vaccines. And then also, you know, kids do still get sick during the summer. They sprain ankles, they play hard at camp and get injuries. And it's another time we need to remember to use every opportunity um, to vaccinate adolescents. So even though August means a lot of kids going to the doctor, it also means there's a lot of opportunities. Um, and so we have a lot of different um, resources at CDC that you can use. So if you are a clinician, um, you can use some of our hold line messaging. So actually um, the top right picture there, the top picture there, adolescent vaccination messaging for practice hold lines. So when someone calls in and they get put on hold waiting to make an appointment, um, we have scripts that someone can read to put on your hold line. If you participate in a program like Phone Rover, um, they already have a lot of CDC scripts available about adolescent immunization and particular HPV vaccine. We also have a lot of MAD articles, and I'll show you a picture um, of, the, of our website with all those listed. If you have any opportunity to send out a newsletter, space on your website um, can get um, an article maybe in a local or regional weekly paper. I live in Tucker, Georgia. We have um, our uh, up close in Tucker and Northside neighbor, um, and so those would be good article, you know, places to put mat articles about um, time to vaccinate your preteens. Um, the third bullet there, the letter. So um, this is really interesting. You know, we hear all the time that schools tend to send a letter out to parents, letting them know that their child has to be vaccinated um, with certain vaccines prior to school starting for those states that have mandates. And so one of the concerns that we've had is that usually those letters don't mention all of the recommended vaccines. So we worked um, closely with the National Association of School Nurses to craft a letter, and I'll show you a picture in a minute, that can be used to send out to parents of preteens um, or even 10-year-olds to let them know that their child had, there are certain routine vaccines that are recommended for ages 11 and 12. We also have a number of, de of posters. These are great for um, various locations, whether it be in a public health clinic or a private um, doctor's office. Um, just a good thing to raise awareness of HPV vaccine and HPV cancer prevention. Another good opportunity um, is that the NIS team data will be released on July 31st. There will be a telebriefing on July 30th. Stay tuned. We'll send out more information about that. So as I said, we have a number of different MAD articles, and so uh, if you go to the Vaccines um, uh, for Preteens and Teens website, um, when all of this will be at the end, um, these resources will be listed. So um, it's also www.cdc.gov slash vaccines, plural, slash teens, also plural. Um, so we have a number of MAD articles here under our multimedia products. So if you look at that left-hand navigation, um, you can see multimedia products, and the last one on the list is MAD articles, and you can just download these. They're Word documents. Um, if you have a, a word limit, you can um, you know, cut some of it out. You can make them longer. You can make them more applicable to your particular area. The letter, this is the letter um, about the vaccines that are recommended for preteens. Um, and you can see that uh, down below the bulleted list, um, you can insert the name of your state and what vaccines are required. 
Um, you can also put information in there um, on who to contact for more information. And this is written to be from a school nurse, but obviously um, this is adaptable and can be used um, for anybody. Uh, doctor's office can use this. So just about anybody could send these out. And again, it's a Word document. We'll actually be sending this out when we send out the slides as well. Something else that you can do, and I actually didn't have this in my list previously, but um, this is something that the state of Minnesota did, um, Minnesota Health Department, um, worked with the high school league to um, change their sports physical assessment form. And so you can see up at the very top immunizations, it says consider TD or Tdap at age 12, MMR, uh, Hep B, varicella, um, polio and influenza. So it actually doesn't even really talk about the vaccines that are recommended at ages 11 or 12. So um, their first round of working with the school system to change this physical assessment form was says consider Tdap, meningococcal, and HPV. Then what they decided to do is instead of considering versus what's required, so there under you can see where it says two required, three required, they changed it so that it would have no distinction between the recommended and required. And now it just says immunizations and it lists them, Tdap, meningococcal, HPV, MMR. So it has them all there. Are they up to date or are they not up to date? If they haven't had Tdap, meninge, or HPV by age 11 or 12, then they're not up to date. If they haven't finished their HPV vaccine series by uh, before age 13, not up to date. So it's a just another way to help remind parents um, that routine adolescent immunization includes HPV vaccination at ages 11 or 12. Um, I am now going to turn it over to Dr. Wilma Robinson. She is the Deputy Director of the Audit Office of Adolescent Health at HHS, um, and she has a project that we've been working on closely with HHS and others um, to get started. So, Wilma, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to talk briefly about a new initiative that the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Offices of Adolescent Health, Women's Health, the National Vaccine Program Office, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have been working on in collaboration with WebMD called Vaccines for Your Preteens, What You Need to Know. The purpose of this collaborative effort is to really educate parents and other caregivers of adolescents on the importance of getting their teens and preteens vaccinated and what vaccines are recommended for preteens and teens. Although the impetus of this project was around increasing the uptake of the HPV vaccine among 11 to 12 year olds, we are presenting that information in the context of adolescent vaccines in general. The thought is that HPV is just one among several vaccines that adolescents should be getting. We are doing this work through the use of WebMD's educational hub, consisting of videos, articles, and a quiz, and a parent checklist of recommended um, vaccines. We intend to launch this site on WebMD on Monday, June 29th, kind of getting in front of the back-to-school rush of vaccinations. And it will uh, be up on the WebMD site through November of this year. And then after that, we will take that content and put it on our own HHS website. This is just a screenshot of how the site will look. Um, we will have videos from experts. Uh, we'll have the checklist. We'll have advertisements about um, HHS resources and also um, other items. This next, this slide just shows the titles of the various videos we have. The videos are done by an expert out of Emory Hospital and just really covers various topics that we think have come up for parents around vaccination. And they're really short videos just to capture their attention and, and um, answer some questions for them. This slide really um, shows that we, are, we have a quiz as well as three articles on key topics that parents have questions about. Uh, in terms of the quiz, the quiz is just an example of what um, this is just an example of what the quiz looks like, but the quiz is really an easy way to kind of dispel myths 
and also answer some frequently asked questions regarding um, vaccinations in preteens. This next slide is an example of the downloadable um, parent guide, which is basically a checklist for vaccines for preteens and teens. And parents can print out this checklist and, or download it and have it available while they're looking to get the required vaccines for their, their adolescents. And this slide, there uh, will also be an HHS branded page um, attached to and linked to the WebMD um, staging site. And this page we are, is where we talk more specifically about HPV and try to answer and provide some facts mostly related to preventing cancer and then some other statistics and um, information for parents. This slide, uh, the way that um, users or consumers will get from the WebMD linked page to the um, branded page for HHS are through a series of rotating modules that appear specifically re related to HPV um, that will link to that HHS branded page. And this is just uh, another prop to let you know that we are launching this site on, on Monday, June 29th, and it will be up through November. This is the link to the site, and um, be on the lookout for this widget. We'll um, be having it on a number of HHS sites that will link you to the WebMD page. And this last slide is just to tell you a little bit about the Office of Adolescent Health. I tell everyone I have to pay the bills, so I always have to talk about my office. And you can find some information related to our office as well as social media sites um, and how to contact us through social media. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Wilma. So I think now um, we're gonna turn it over to our Q&A moderator to find out what kind of questions we're getting. Yes, we have a few questions from audience members. The first one is, would the committee consider realigning its ACIP recommended adolescent age bracket from 11 to 12 year olds to 10 to 12 year olds to reflect the age at which TDAP is sometimes given to students um, for required entry to sixth grade? Uh, I think that that is probably an excellent question for the ACIP's HPV work group, and I will definitely let them know that that is one of the questions that we've received. I know that they, a lot of different things go into consideration in terms of the um, ACIP recommendations, and usually the recommendations are based on data, um, and, uh, you know, the various indications, indicated ages, things like that, but we will definitely let them know that this is one of the questions. Okay. The next question is, insurance companies still recognize HPV-9 as experimental for males 15 and older. Is there literature available to indicate the opposite? So there's not currently an indication from the FDA um, for uh, males to receive 9-valent HPV vaccine um, at ages 16 through 26. Um, that data has not... Um, they have, uh, Merck has provided that data, but we have not yet um, gotten, the FDA has not provided an indication yet. Usually that process takes about a year. Um, so, however, um, the ACIP did recommend um, HP vaccine for boys and girls uh, routinely at ages 11 and 12, and for those who had not yet been um, vaccinated, 13 to 26 for girls, 13 to 21 for boys, and then obviously um, 22 through 26 for um, men who have sex with men or men with uh, immunocompromised um, systems. And so uh, usually a payer, an insurance company, follows the ACIP recommendations, not the FDA indications. Um, and the way that the Affordable Care Act is written is it is written about ACIP recommendations. And so really, um, as long as they are not in that loophole of being a grandfathered plan, um, they should be paying it based on the ACIP. Now they do have a year from the time that the ACIP recommendation comes out to it becoming part of the plan, that is part of the um, Affordable Care Act, the ACA, um, which the Supreme Court just voted to uphold, um, that came out yesterday. So um, for some plans, it may take the full year. So 
the recommendation was published on March 27th, 2015. There may be some plans that don't have it in place until March 26th, 2016. Um, although we do know that about 90% of managed care insurance plans are covering it. It's also a part of the VFC contract. Um, so most folks are covered right now. Um, the next question is for um, Wilma Robinson about the um, OAH website. How do you plan to track impact of use? How do you know this effort is being utilized? That is an excellent question. In the ideal world, we would have um, combined it with a actual evaluation. And as an, an evaluator, that is something that I really press for. But right now, we have to use analytics. And so we are actually tracking what coverage is now and uh, looking and seeing, and we know this is not directly correlated, but um, looking at what coverage is now state by state, looking at who's been accessing information in, in what state, and really trying to see if we can say anything or even just target some more resources to certain areas. So we don't have a formalized evaluation. Uh, we will have some analytics from the site and we will be using that to kind of look and see what the coverage levels look like. And I can add to that as well. Um, the other thing that we'll be able to do is um, see if someone is on the new site on WebMD's website. Um, if they leave that to go to, like, say, the CDC yeah. website, we'll be able to measure that. I mean, the other thing is to remember that, um, you know, WebMD is a consumer site, and lots and lots of people go to search for information there. And I don't know their exact numbers, um, but they do um, pride themselves on being sort of the number one place that parents are going to look for information. So and it provides another opportunity to have our message on their site. It does, and that was one of the reasons why we looked to partner with WebMD. And also, we recently found out through um, some of the youth tech groups that actually adolescents um, get most of the information from WebMD. So it's not only, and even though WebMD will tell you that's not their target group, that is where a lot of adolescents are going to get their health information. Um, the next question, since only pregnant women are recommended to get more than one um, Tdap vaccine. How does the effect? How does that affect infants and subsequent births getting pertussis from other adult household contacts? Um, so uh, the maternal Tdap protection that's um, conferred when um, mom gets vaccinated when she's pregnant in her um, third trimester um, protects the infant for about six months, which gets them through to getting their Dtap shots. And so the idea is that um, it helps confer protection until the period of time when they start getting their shots and start building their own antibodies. Um, and then as it is recommended that with every pregnancy, um, a mother be getting her shots. And so with each pregnancy, she's going to be conferring antibodies. And then that child will pick up as they get their DTAP shots. Um, and so that's how they would get continued protection. Um, you know, we DTAP there, there's so many shots over a certain period of time, and so they're very protected um, from the time that they're um, an infant through um, needing to get the Tdap shot as an ad as an adolescent. Um, the next question um, is in regards to making a strong recommendation. What is the source of the guidelines for providers to give strong recommendations, and do your materials tell them what it means to give a strong recommendation? Yeah, so um, we actually don't show the material in this slide set, but we've shown it before, and I can tell you where to get to it. If you go to www.cdc.gov slash vaccines slash you are the key, um, on there we have our tips and time savers um, fact sheet for clinicians um, on how to give a strong and effective recommendation and what the different parts of a strong and effective recommendation are. Um, essentially, the best recommendation is one that bundles all the adolescent vaccines together. So your child um, is due for three vaccines today that will protect them from meningitis, the cancers caused by HPV, as well as provide a booster for whooping cough. Do you have any questions for me? And so that's actually a really strong and effective recommendation. And the data that we have to support that is that there have been studies done um, looking at when providers give certain types um, of recommendations, and they use dialogue research to determine this, how parents respond to those recommendations. 
Um, we also have a lot of data around whether or not parents decide to get their child vaccinated and what type of recommendation. So the parents rate the recommendation on a strong recommendation, just a recommendation, brought it up in conversation or didn't talk about it at all. And so looking at that, we can see that for um, parents who got a strong recommendation from a clinician, um, or rather for parents who vaccinate their children, 45% of them received a strong recommendation. So it is based on data and we do know that that is something that is, that's working. Um, we've actually received a few questions about the meningococcal B vaccine. Um, the first one is, um, can providers give the vaccine without a VIS? Um, so I am not as well versed in the um, laws around it, but I believe that every time you give a vaccine, you have to give a VIS with it. Um, and I'm not sure when the VIS will become available. Usually it takes a couple of months. Now, um, with Men B, um, you know, currently the recommendation that's been published in the MMWR has to do with um, outbreaks and persons at risk. Um, and, you know, it takes a while to go through the process of um, when ACIP votes versus it becoming um, a published recommendation and the middle step in there is CDC accepting um, the vote that um, ACIP makes and so it's a long process and um, by the end of that you get a publication in the MMWR and it's usually after that that a VIS comes out. Um, so that's the best way I can answer that question right now. Um, I think that covers most of the questions asked. Um, a few people are interested, Jill, in knowing whether or not the slides will be made available. Yeah, absolutely. We can totally send out the slides. In fact, we can do that in advance of the recording becoming available. Um, we'll send the slides out. We're also going to send out that nurse letter that we discussed, um, the school nurse letter, and we can get those sent out to everyone who registered for the webinar. Okay. Um, and we can move into the polling question. And we're just going to launch two polling questions to get feedback from audience members about um, how helpful this presentation was and whether or not you plan to use the information provided. Um, you should see two questions appear on your screen. And um, you can go on and enter your responses. And it's good to see that most of you, um, a lot of you feel that the information provided today was helpful or very helpful. And so now we'll launch the second poll. And the webinar poll was also showing that um, most people felt that um, they were very likely to use the information provided. Um, so Jill, we will turn it back to you. All right. Well, we'd like to thank everyone um, for joining us today on our webinar. Um, thank you for participating. For more information, you can go to our website at cdc.gov slash vaccines slash teens and from there you can get to all the resources that we discussed today. You can also get to the You Are the Key site by going to the provider page on that website um, and it will take you to the You Are the Key site. We always encourage you to email us if you have any questions and you receive those emails um, in the um, confirmation of your registration and we look forward to speaking with you again in a couple of months. Thanks everyone.